Hi, everyone. How are you Hello. all? Hi. Thank you guys so much for joining. Um, so I, I, before we start, I want to give you a quick uh, reason of why we're doing this and what I hope you will get out of this. Um, so uh, my name is Juliana Cardona. Uh, I'm the founder of Street Entrepreneurs. Um, we operate in Washington, D.C. and serve uh, the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area entrepreneurs. Um, we, we care deeply about ensuring that people with talent, heart, and hustle have access to the education, capital, and networks they need to solve problems that matter. And since COVID-19 started, we have received endless requests um, from entrepreneurs asking a lot of similar questions. Um, one of those questions has been, how do I digitize my business? Um, and of course, we know that it's hard to digitize um, a lot of businesses. Like if you're in the haircutting world, for instance, you can't really do a digital haircut. But during this workshop, we're going to try and answer some questions and give you some guidance as to how you can begin creating um, a digital revenue stream. Um, and uh, we'll be recording the session for other entrepreneurs who aren't able to attend because we want to keep the, this a fireside chat um, and then give others access to, to the educational information. So without further ado, let me introduce Adam. Adam, thank you so much for being here and for taking the time. Yeah, no, I really appreciate this. Um, Juliana and I connected over LinkedIn and very quickly decided that we should do a workshop together. Uh, maybe it's because of some shared perspectives. Uh, maybe it's because we both come from families of entrepreneurs, so something that we bonded over very quickly. But um, yeah, I, I have a history in my family of, of people who run and start businesses nothing prolific, but small business, which, you know, is an important element of the economy. And I put together a presentation. I would love to walk through it with you all. And what I'll say is, so I'm an executive coach and I'll talk a little bit more about me in a second when I throw up some slides, but to contextualize the presentation, I really try and look one or two layers below tools and tips and tricks because you can find a million lists on the internet about what tools you should use or how can you, you know, do like what we're doing, video calls or organize your day. Um, that's not what this is about. This is about sets of questions and ways to look at some of the challenges to help get unstuck, to help open up possibilities. All right, so digitizing your business, leveraging this moment to transform your offer. And so digitizing your business for me strikes me as sort of the what, but we're going to look at the how and some of the why behind this. And there's a very popular model called by Simon Sinek called the golden circle. Um, and I can share that link afterwards also, but a lot of my, my thought process revolves around that. So I'm a partner with the Kadar group. This is, we got links at the bottom. If you want to find me online at Adam Mutchler everywhere. Um, oops. Here we go. So who am I? Not, not in, an ex, in an existential way, but my name is Adam Mutchler. I'm a partner at the Kadar Group. We're a boutique coaching and organizational development company based in DC. We do work around the country. We do work globally. Traditionally, the work is a mix of in-person and virtual. At the moment, it is virtual. Uh, I'm a founder. I, I've started multiple businesses. Uh, I've started multiple projects. I'm a host. I have a couple podcasts. I, I really see myself as a creator, whether I'm creating work for founders to use or whether I'm creating you know, something creative like my shows. I'm a lot of things. And I think we all are a lot of things to a lot of different people. And I just like to contextualize that when I think about the world. So what's happening? What are we dealing with? let's state the obvious, the absolute obvious. We are in a period of crisis. And I think it's important to state certain things that are obvious because sometimes we go into this mode of this isn't happening or 
it'll just be a moment or someone else is going to take care of it or someone will tell me what to do. But as business, as people in the business world, or if you have your own business that you're running, it's important to triage what the reality is. So we're in a period of crisis and we don't know how long it's going to last. And this, this statement is something that I think is one of the most anxiety producing elements of this. We keep getting different dates. We keep getting different projections about when will shelter in places end? How long will they go on for? When will this be resolved? When is there a vaccine? There are a lot of questions out there during this crisis. And I think another thing to sort of start wrapping our arms and minds around is we don't know how long this will last. So what can you do? What worked yesterday may not work today or tomorrow. And so questions that I would invite you to consider as you're thinking about your work and how it relates to the current state of affairs and what's going on in the world. What are your core values? And you can think about this at a personal level or you can think about this at a business level, but what are the core values that drive your decisions and that drive your actions and that drive, if you're running a business, your business? So, you know, for me, authenticity, connectivity, humility are core values. Being, you know, I'm a giver. I love to support businesses. These are, these are core elements of who I am and core elements of my business offer. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. What's your mission? So my, to share my mission, really high level summary, is to reduce the leadership deficit in the world whether it's within individuals, whether it's within organizations, or whether it's with communities. So looking at what, reminding yourself, what's your, what are your core values and what is your mission? And what are your primary offers? So if you run your own business, again, revisiting, what are your primary offers to your, your primary customer? you know, whether they're individuals or businesses or communities or educational institutions, reassessing and looking at what are your primary offers that you've been making and how have these been impacted during this period of crisis? So when you think about your values, how have they been impacted? When you think about your mission, how have they been, how has it been impacted? And when you think about your primary offers, how have, how have they been impacted as well? And so through the filter of my business, I look at my values and I say, I'm a connector. Personally, I'm an extrovert. And what's going on in the world is impacting how I'm able to socialize and interact and, 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 and work with people. Uh, how has it impacted my mission? We're getting a really unbelievable front row look at leadership from businesses and from govern just governance of society. And so I'm getting a really close look at what are companies doing that are really, really effective and positive? What are companies doing that are really negative? What are mayors, governors, political leaders across the world doing that's really effective, what's not? And it's actually creating a much broader perspective of what are some leadership deficits in our society at different levels. Uh, and my primary offers. So through this, through this experience, in-person work has been postponed or canceled. So that's impacting some of my primary offers. Virtual work is picked up. So that's actually impacting primary offers in a positive way. But considering these, these three things and what's the impact? What are your core values, your mission, your offers, and how have they been impacted during this crisis? So who do you serve? So one of the things during crisis that my, in my experience, when I talk to clients, the first thing we start to think about is what's going on with us? What's the impact on me? What's the impact on the business? You know, how do I triage sort of the internal piece? But if you have clients or if you have customers or stakeholders, thinking about who you serve and thinking about your customers, remember who your core customers are, how are they engaging with you and how do they typically make purchases or enroll in your services or in, interact with whatever your offer is. And in this time, consider how have they been impacted? What is the impact 
on your customers been during this period of crisis? And an invitation is if you don't know, just ask them, have that conversation, engage with them. The best way to set yourself up to make a really meaningful offer during these times and future times is really understand what are your current customers need? Because you may be able to double down on something that really works for them. They just, that you just aren't aware of yet. So reframing your offer. You may already have everything you need. When re-envisioning your offer, consider new techniques to leverage your products and services that closely align with your core values and mission. I don't like to read off slides too much, but it's something that I wrote and thought about a little bit. And I think it's a good, it's, it's a good summary. There's no need to reinvent the wheel, right? So there may already be, you may have created a bunch of content. You may have developed certain products and services and put a lot of energy into that over the years. The question is, how do you line those, that effort up with what the world is requiring from us now? So the first, and I alluded to this in the previous slide, connect and learn. Connect and learn from your existing customers. Ask them what they need from your business. That's the absolute best place to start. You can bang your head against the wall trying to figure out how to re redo things, reset things, redo your offers. But to ask the people that are already invested in you, whether they're paying you or they're subscribing or they're enrolling in whatever you're, whatever you're providing, ask them. Is what you're providing still working? Would they like to see something different? Evolve your offer. So it doesn't have to be a category, categorically different offer, but your existing products and services are your launching pad. Consider ways to amplify them in a digital world. And I'll get into some examples after this slide around what that would look like. But I think one of the big things that I'm seeing with small businesses is this sort of panic reaction of, I need to change everything, or I need to start over. The truth is you will most likely already have a really strong launch pad to evolve the offer that you've already been making. Empathy. Everyone in the world got an email from every email list they've ever subscribed to in the month of March. And every company had a, their response to COVID-19 in like the first two weeks of March, especially in the United States. And in those emails, my takeaway was, I'm really learning what companies really understand the challenge and what companies are just writing a response because they think they have to write a response. It was really, really obvious. So empathy more now than ever. Communicate how your offers are shifting and show that you understand the new challenges. Making new offers for the sake of making new offers will miss the mark. Making, making offers that are connected to previous offers that you've made or previous products and services and explaining how they're shifting or how you're adjusting to the challenges that we're experiencing today. Show your customers or clients or members that you're really that you're really thinking about what you're doing and that you're listening to their needs and that you're thinking about how can we continue providing that impact and that level of service that you know who your 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 stakeholders have come to uh, come to appreciate and the last one here is community and I think that's actually one of the things that's happening here with Juliana and street entrepreneurs and these workshops with physical distancing and the trauma of this period of crisis that this period of crisis is creating, explore ways to build authentic community. So what does that look like to your business? What does that look like to your stakeholders? What does it look like to your clients? So I have a friend who works for a, it's a digital platform for advocacy. And they're starting to do round tables with their clients so inviting all clients together and having one client present or speak on how they're navigating this challenge. Not something they did before, but they're starting to create community that's related to the work that they do for their internal community of clients, existing clients, right? And they're a product-based company. And so there, there are ways of creating connection and connectivity that show 
really what people are going to need coming out of this and during this is our brands and people who are looking to bring each other together and say, this is something we are all experiencing and how are we going to navigate this? So here are, good, here are some examples of where things were before the, the global pandemic. And you'll see a list on the right, it's on my right, it should be on your right, of where things are now. So it'll be two lists. The first list, a coffee shop, an acupuncture practice, mail order nail polish, restaurants, in-person education, retail stores, clothing brands, and real, estates, real estate. All of these businesses and industries just like every, every industry and business have been impacted. And so on the right, we'll go through a list of how I've observed, and I'm sure you've also observed, businesses making shifts. So a coffee shop, La Coloma is a great example. They have cafes all over the East Coast. They're based in Philadelphia. They produce coffee. They also have communal spaces, coffee shops. And what they've done is they've really leaned into shipping coffee direct to consumer. So I just ordered like four 12 ounce bags of coffee and they're shipping faster than they used to and they've increased what they ship. Uh, they're really sort of on their toes and thinking about how do, we, how do we evolve our existing offer? Acupuncture practice. So actually my dad has built an acupuncture practice over the last 20 years and he had physical offices and locations and he's been considering winding down the physical space but with what was, what's going on in the world, he made a decision in the timing with his lease that he was actually going to close his acupuncture practice after 20 years. And what he's been, he's been working on behind the scenes for some time is creating a platform to provide virtual health support, consulting, advocacy, and virtual, virtual advice. And it's a natural progression. What are his existing skills? What's the knowledge base that he knows more than anything else? And how can he offer it to a community in a situation that they've never experienced before. Mail order nail polish. Uh, there's a company, Olive and June. I, I bolded these on the left and right. They were already online ordering direct to consumer. But one of the things that they've done on their social media is really stepped up how to, like best practices for at-home manicures, best practices for nail design. They've been doing Instagram live videos every day at three call it it's called like the Manny boot camp or something like that but they've really leaned into how do we connect with our customers in a new way in an innovative way in a creative way another great example restaurants there's a there's a restaurant group in dc farmers and fishers and they have farmers and fishers farmers and distillers and they have a couple other locations i forget their names they've turned all of their restaurants into it's like small marketplaces. So you can actually order groceries and pick them up at these restaurants. So while they can't wine and dine people in the, in the store, they're using their supply chains, their, their vendors to acquire staples that people would want to purchase and have at home. And that happened pretty quickly. In-person education, I think, is a really obvious one. Most academic institutions have shifted to online learning. Retail stores have shifted if you didn't already have a strong online store a lot of them are shifting to online orders uh, contactless delivery a lot of local small businesses have increased their sort of delivery offerings so that people can keep ordering or contactless pickup and one of the really cool things that's happened in the last couple of weeks clothing brands a lot of clothing brands companies with manufacturing pipelines with clothing manufacturers have shifted to making ppe production a priority so personal protective equipment, non-medical face masks, smocks, all sorts of incredible things that they have all the resources to do it. It was never a product that they offered, but they leaned heavily into what do we know, right? And the last one, and this is just kind of an interesting observation, real estate. You used to go to open houses, you used to go schedule tours, and Redfin, I think within a week of everything kind of really shutting down, updated their app and immediately off, started offering uh, live video tours. So you, you don't book an in-person session, you book a live video tour, an agent goes to a house, they're on FaceTime or WhatsApp, they're walking through the house. Something that we could have done in the past, and I'm sure people did when they were 
purchasing when they didn't live in the, in the location that they were buying, but has immediately become the standard for them so that people can still view homes and look and look to see what's out there. That's what I got. Simple, straight to the point. Uh, and I'd love to engage in a conversation, answer any questions. And if this is recorded and shared out later, you know, welcome people finding me at Adam Mutchler to ask me any questions about what they've heard or learned. And I'm sure Juliana will share my contact information uh, down the road. So I think since um, both of the people who joined are in the education space, um, and Allison just mentioned she had to run, but um, we focus on how can educators um, change to online. Diana, is it okay if we use your particular challenge as an example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love that. That would be awesome. Um, so we have, we have 15 minutes or so for some custom coaching around your particular need, which is awesome. Yeah, so, do it. <laughs> um, Adam, do you want to dive in? Yeah, so did you, did you write a specific question or what would, uh, what would be helpful? I really think with the time that we have, what could we chat about? Oh, you asked me? Okay. So um, I actually have an idea that I'd like to explore. The issue I'm running up against is um, switching kind of like to this full digital platform. Well, more digital platform than I was doing originally. I just wonder about the resources needed to do it, like the funding for it. Mm -hmm. Like, is it possible for me to do with limited funding right now? Um, it's really kind of the biggest question that I have and, and, and how do I do it? So my thought process is, and so all of this kind of everything happening with, you know, the pandemic is definitely unfortunate. Um, but I have to admit that I was already thinking about ways to shift my business and think about sustainability well before this happened. And so it kind of seemed like when this happened, it was like, okay, well, now it's definitely the time to get it done. Right. So my um, thought process is I'd, I still have all the content, like you said, that I've developed. There's nothing really new that I'm going to add. Um, it's still the same kind of resource that individuals want. It's just how do I provide it to them in a way that's accessible and quite frankly affordable. And so um, what I'm thinking is to shift to a um, website or app, I guess whichever is more feasible for me, but some type of online center where individuals can um, almost kind of have like a digital subscription to the content material. So schools can kind of like pay, for, pay per month, you know, for certain subscription packages. And so of course, if you get like the largest subscription package, then you get like the entire curriculum program. So that includes like your curriculum map and your, your PowerPoints, your, um, your handouts, whatever the, those, you know, whatever it comes like in like that curriculum, you get all of that. In addition to like your one-on-one -on -one training and coaching, which would be virtual. Um, later, once all the size down, like, it can still be in person, but for now it'll like be virtual services. And I'd also kind of like to throw in some kind of like on-demand training videos um, and some kind of also on-demand lessons, which correspond to the content material. So let's say there's like lesson one, there's like a lesson plan for lesson one, and there's a handout for lesson one, there's a PowerPoint for lesson one. I'd also like to add, and this is content that I would have to develop, but I'd also like to add like an actual physical kind of like recitation of that lesson. So kind of like actually physically, like a webinar, have you, what have you, that corresponds to like that content material. Um, which I think, honestly, the idea of moving to that is really an easy shift in my mind. It's just, how do I physically do that? And is that a service that is more accessible to my schools and something that they would want to kind of partake in? And my thought process is, yes, um, for a couple of reasons, but primarily also just because 
one of the greatest barriers that I hear from all of my schools is it's just too expensive. Like we, we mm-hmm. want it, we love it. We just can't afford it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that kind of like a monthly subscription fee feels a lot more manageable than a larger hefty price tag. So anyway, those are my thoughts. And um, I would welcome anything, anything at all. Yeah. Um, I think the big question for me, and you, you alluded to it already, are you, do you already have sort of the content and do you have the content mapped out? Do you have all the content available? Or are you talking about starting from scratch on building your content? Mm-hmm. So all of my content is done. You know, there's nothing really new that I'm going to be developing. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing that I would be developing is the on-demand videos that correspond to the lessons. Cool. Um, there are two platforms that come to mind that might be interesting to explore. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm someone who has a lot of ideas, and I'm in a completely different content space as you, but I, a lot of my work is content-based. And I am also not a programmer, designer, like, like I have, I, I can only build on platforms that are WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Exactly. <laughs> and so the, the two platforms that are coming to mind that could be very interesting, one is Teachable, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. It's an online learning management platform. Uh, you can create courses. You can create promo codes you can charge you determine what you charge there's quizzes there's places for links and videos and all sorts of stuff so if you have existing content you may be able to easily create a course and then go to organizations and and offer it as a as a as a package or a you know a subscription of some kind the other one that could be very interesting and i just learned about it um in the last month is called mighty networks mighty networks and Mighty Networks is currently blowing my mind because <laughs> basically what the way it works is there's a free version, there's a community version, and there's a professional version ranging from zero to a hundred dollars a month to, to subscribe as a, as a creator. And the concept is you create a network. So for me and my business, it's tkg.connect mm-hmm. and People, you can determine whether access to the network is free or if it's paid, it could be a one-time fee, it can be a subscription. That's the first part. And then within the network, you can create private groups and make workshop offerings and all sorts of different sort of subgroups. And you can actually enroll people into subgroups. So they may have access to one group and the broader network, but they don't have access to all the other groups. So for your business, you might have, what's the name of your business? Youth Justice Incorporated. Yeah, so it might be like Youth Justice Incorporated Mighty Network. Mm -hmm. And within the Youth Justice Incorporated Mighty Network, anyone that joins has access to your broader level of content, but then a school would have its own subgroup. Mm -hmm. And so members from that school would have a private space just for people from the school. Um, and you can do, you can do a lot of really interesting things and it comes paired with an app. So you can already see here. So as you're building your mighty network, people can download the mighty network app. And when they log into your community, every time they go back to the app, Mm -hmm. it's, it's just your community. Like I'll show you on mine or we'll come here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My phone, like people, it's just, it's just branded the Mm Kadar group. Um, and so those are two platforms that could be interesting to look at. And the other main reason is it's a flat fee. Mm-hmm. So it's not like if you have, it, it might be a lot if you only have a very small group of members, but if you had 10,000 members, it's still like 99 bucks. Yeah. You know, and if you have a lot of existing content, besides the effort of matching it into the, uh, the parameters of Teachable or Mighty Networks, which would take you time. Once it's there, you're you're rocking and rolling. You just have to keep talking to your to your existing schools and using this virtual approach, like you mentioned, opens you up to any school in mm-hmm. the country that's interested, exactly. which I'm sure you thought about. 
Yes. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. I think, so I think the next thing that comes to mind is, um, one thing I've always struggled with is marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, Thus far, we have gotten by on like super word of mouth, right? Like someone likes the program, it's working in their school, someone goes out to happy hour, they're like, oh my God, you got to call you justice. And then we got our next client, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Which is great, by the way. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And it is great, but I don't see it being very uh, sustainable or, or really kind of having like the longevity that I need. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd like something a bit more strategic. So um, when I think about launching a whole new platform, I feel daunted by the idea of how do I get the information? Like how do I get it out, the word out there that, hey, like we are completely really kind of shifting over to the really like exciting and interactive, you know, new way to interact with the material um like how do i get that out into the world into the schools that we that we communicate with especially now um when it's kind of like we're all together but we're not at the same time yeah yeah i think that's a, i mean like that's a great question and i will say two things you already have something that a lot of people wish they had which is great word of mouth because mm-hmm. it's free <laughs> you know so that for 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 every business and i'm putting you in this bucket that say it says they have great word of mouth and they wish they had a stronger strategic marketing plan there are a hundred businesses that say i wish i had great word of mouth <laughs> <laughs> um so you know th- those are your those are your power users and your and your advocates which is which is incredible and i would say ask ask people that are already your customers this goes back to sort of in the presentation like connect and learn from your customers mm-hmm ask them how they heard about you, even if it was word of mouth, like see if you can get specific, ask them what it was about, um, about what they heard about you that really made them reach out or contact you. And, Mm -hmm. you know, ask them where they learn about these things. Where do you, where do you find new programs for students? Where do you find new, new ideas, you know, to bring into your school or your community? And, and you can be specific. Can you give me three examples? Maybe some people will, maybe some people won't, but you're going to learn something from those conversations. Mm-hmm. And, and somewhere in there, you'll say, oh, here's an association that mm-hmm. literally shares this information or, oh, whatever, fill in the blank. Gotcha. Um, but you'll learn something from that experience. And then I don't know if you have customer personas that you've developed, which is just like, create. and if I'm tell- telling you something you already know, you can immediately interrupt me. Um, I don't but, Okay, <laughs> so basically designing personas of your of the buyer, people that have purchased or, or enrolled in your program saying, oh, principals, here's, here's one persona, principals. Mm-hmm. Here's another persona, like the head of the PTA hears about the program and says, hey, we need to bring this into the school. Mm-hmm. You know, who are the types of people that are bringing you into communities and signing agreements with you and say, okay, how do I, how do they receive information and how, how do I design my marketing to communicate to those people specifically? Right? Like I was just on a, I just had a call today with someone and I was on their website mm-hmm. and they do like medical stuff and I'm on their website. I'm like, man, this website's really confusing. And he was explaining that people who buy from him understand exactly what that website communicates. <laughs> and I was like, good point. It doesn't matter what I think. I'm not buying from you. Yeah. You know, and so I, I think thinking about that will inform a marketing strategy. It'll say, okay, now I know these are the three to five people that I'm trying to communicate to. And these are the publications and the channels and everything that they follow and listen to. And these are the concerns that they have. So I, here's how I'm responding to those concerns. Mm-hmm. You know, like you do this first, your whole platform, your, your whole offer sounds really interesting. If I had to guess, and this is unfortunate, there will be a, in, in sort of the debrief and retrospective of what's going on right now in, with education is, and this is completely anecdotal and just my own assessment, increase in online bullying, you know, increase in sort of uh, tardiness and absentees for, for school and class, um, sort of more, more disruptive behavior. I have a friend who teaches a high school. I'm like, what's the craziest stuff you've seen on video chats? He's like, guys not wearing shirts. Mm -hmm. you know the class or like people playing clearly playing video games like like looking like this you know exactly so 
the types of topics and mitigation and mediation that's going to come up mm -hmm. with, 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 within the school systems is going to shift. Yeah. You know, so I think that there could be some interesting content around that. Yeah. And I almost feel like your particular business is very well positioned to respond to some of the challenge, new challenges that are arising. Right. So it's one thing to handle discipline when you're in person. But how do you handle discipline digitally, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this is a whole new product line that I'm sure schools are trying to figure out how to tackle. So think about this moment and think about how are you particularly positioned to answer the call and the problems that are arising right now. Yeah. Um, I also want to say that um, if you haven't signed up for a founders retreat, mm -hmm. you ought to ASAP. So Founders Retreats are focused on people that are solving a problem that matters. Mm -hmm. And we, we have in-person trainings, which hopefully we'll be running in the summertime. Uh, and we, we help people think through uh, their marketing plan, right? And you actually, while you're there, you create a marketing plan. You create user personas, right? Um, you think through pricing, you think through multiple sales strategies, right? Through your communications and you leave with, with a plan mm -hmm. on how to execute. And more importantly, you connect with 10 or so mentors and coaches that will guide you beyond that moment. And you connect with peers who are going through the same thing you are. Mm -hmm. So when you feel a little bit lost and you need someone to reach out to, they're there. And finally, the most promising ventures are selected by their peers um, on the final day. And those individuals go on to Street Pitch. And Street Pitch is like American Idol meets Shark Tank, where we bring the most driven people from every ward of Washington, DC, together for one annual event, um, where they get to um, pitch their the physical community and a digital community and the people watching invest with their money in one of three ways, equity crowdfunding, product purchases, or in-kind contributions. And we help you look at what are all the, the funding spectrum you can access and what might be the best for you. And if you are looking to raise for profit dollars, then um, what does an offer letter look like, right? Um, and we partner with a really cool platform called Crowdfund Main Street. Um, that's uh, one of the first and best equity crowdfunding sites out there um, to help you go through that. So um, definitely encourage you to apply um, so you can get more, more information. We also have some other workshops coming up that are looking at digital marketing, digital sales, um, and a lot more. Awesome. And maybe we'll have Adam repeat, repeat teach this time in person. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I would love that. I mean, I think, yeah, that'd be awesome. one of the things that Juliana and I connected on, you know, is, is the need to provide more resources and perspectives to seasoned and sort of green business owners, mm -hmm. right? I think that I, I'm experiencing this with big corporations, big corporations have a lot of resources, small companies have very few. Mm -hmm. you know and it's I just want to help people at every stage of the journey yeah well thank you for that <laughs> that's awesome. awesome that is awesome and Diana um if it's okay I really want to post this so it can help other people who have similar questions you have mm -hmm. and also I want to encourage people who are watching um if they have any additional resources for you to just add it in the feed so if they're like, I know of a school that would love this. Yeah. They can just type it right in so we can begin creating some digital marketing for you. Is that okay? That's more than A-OK. -okay. Beautiful. So I'm going to post this entire call. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all at the next one. Exactly. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good one. Bye.